Well, good morning. I'm so excited to get to be here with you this morning and get to talk about our third week into our Face Down 40 Days of Prayer and Fasting. So just a reminder, you know, the goal of our time of doing this is not just to be able to check off and say, hey, you know, I started 2021 with 40 Day of Fasting. Aren't that cool? Can I have another notch in my crown there, right? That's not what it's about. This is a goal that we would be God's people, that we would embrace God's vision for our life, that we would be his holy priesthood. You know, something Josh said the very first week that we got this started, he said, you know, we can be great worshipers, and we can sing really well, and we can worship God, and you guys know me. I love that. I love that part of being able to encounter God that way. And we can be great teachers, and we can preach the word of God boldly, and we can be great servants, and we can, we can serve God, and we can have amazing ministries, and God is pleased with all of those things. But really and truly, all of those things are just the fruit of what God is doing in our hearts as his people. So that's what we're just going to keep digging into, that we're coming before his holy presence We want to hear his voice. We want to respond in obedience, confess our sins, and we want to know him more. So in the past two weeks, we've talked about repentance, which that was a pretty heavy week. And honestly, I thought it was just going to be Sunday. And I was like, sweet, that that's done. You know, God brought some things to my mind that I needed to confess before him. And then I was like, Woo, let's move off in freedom. And then, like, we went into staff meeting together, and we're talking about repentance again. And then we had our Thursday morning prayer meeting, which is every week on Zoom, and we're talking about repentance again. I was like, oh, my goodness, Lord, this repentance is super heavy. (laughs) But it's been good. It's been really good. And then the week before, we were talking about God's holiness and coming before his holy presence. Today, I'm really excited because we're moving into our third week, and this is a time of looking at what does it look like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So when we think about how we relate to the Holy Spirit, it can be challenging. You know, the Bible tells us that God is three in one. He is the Father, He is Son, and He is Holy Spirit. All right, so God the Father. As human beings, we all biologically have or st- had, have or have had a father, right? Now, maybe that was a good experience for you. Maybe that it wasn't a good experience. Maybe he was present in your life. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe if he wasn't present, there was someone who stepped into your life to be a fatherly figure. But we all have had some sort of experience with a fatherly role in our lives. Now, if I just want to encourage you that if, if your experience has been a bad one, to be encouraged that God can redeem that. He can use that as a mirror of his goodness, or he can, he can redeem that. So for me, I'm super blessed to have an amazing earthly father. He has always encouraged me and loved me and been present and been a, a a beautiful guide to what it looks like to follow the Father. So I am so grateful for that. And so when I think about relating to the Father, I'm like, sweet, yep, God the Father, high five. I'm good. I can wrap my head around that. God the Son. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the Son of God. He is 100% fully God. In Philippians 2, we read that, Jesus, being in very nature God, made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. He made himself in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. God the Son, he came. He took on human flesh. He experienced the things that we experience. He went through all of those emotions. I can wrap my head around that. All right, Jesus, God's son, high five. I'm with you. I can, I'm, I'm good with this. God the Holy Spirit. 
Now, it can be hard to know how to relate to the Holy Spirit, so that's what we're going to talk about this morning, and we're going to even spend some time fleshing this out and putting some exercise behind it. So get ready. Here we go. Now, I love the way that the Bible starts out right at the get-go. Genesis 1.1. And he says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. Aha, I end. And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I love this. See, I, I relate and I connect and I can see God through his creation. Man, I love watching a sunset, and even here lately, I even love watching the sunrise. This has not always been the case in my life. I love sitting at the beach and watching the ocean roll back and forth, or even looking at vast mountain peaks and seeing them topped with snow. Like, I just, I love that. I love watching nature shows that explain why animals do what they do. I love that they say, you know, like whales swim this way for a purpose. And kangaroos, they hop the way they do for a purpose. And the birds of the air, they fly and they do what they do and they they show their feathers and they exclaim their beauty for a purpose. Now, all those things are really cool, right? But when I look at those things, I see the same God who created me. My creator is the one who made all of these things for us to enjoy. So when the Bible says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, like that just paints this beautiful picture in my mind. So I'm going to share with you a little story about my introduction to the Holy Spirit. So when I was, I don't know, 10, 11 years old, my family was a part of a group of families who were starting a new church. They were starting a new fellowship. And the the funny thing about this is that eventually, you know, we kind of outgrew living rooms and we outgrew some storefronts and we're like, well, where are we going to meet? And there was a campground in my town down in Georgia. And we began to meet at this campground. It was really beautiful. And when it was cold outside, they would allow us to come in and take out the tables from their cafeteria and pull in chairs and a sound system. And there we would, we would worship and we would fellowship and we would pray and we were starting this new church. Now, like I said, it was Georgia, so we didn't have to meet inside for very long because it's really beautiful most of the year. And so there was this tabernacle that was on the campground. You know, it's just really simple, concrete slab on the ground and um, a, a stage not elaborate, just basically raised ground, and just had a simple structure and probably some screens because, you know, there were bugs. There was always lots of bugs. And one day, because my family was a part of this core team of family starting this church, we were always either the first ones there and usually the last ones to leave. So as a little girl, my parents, you know, were doing their thing. And I had wandered off and was doing some exploring on this campground. And I wandered into this tabernacle and, you know, popped up on the edge of the stage, dangling my feet, just kind of hanging out. And I'm, I'm thinking this was probably sometime in the fall because there were all these dead leaves that had started to cover the ground of this tabernacle. And I was sitting there, and the, the wind began to blow, and these leaves started to swirl and twirl. And, you know, you, kinda, you can hear in your mind's eye, right, the, the crackling and the, the whooshing of the wind. I like to paint pictures, if you can't tell. And I'm watching this, and, you know, it was early 90s, and there was a worship leader who I had become very fond of. His name was Keith Green, and he was a worship leader in the 70s and the 80s. And his lyrics just really caught me at this stage in my journey with walking with the Lord. And there was a song that I really believe the Spirit brought back to my mind as I'm sitting in this tabernacle watching what's happening in front of me with these leaves. And it's called Rushing Wind, and it says, Rushing wind, blow through this temple. 
blowing out the dust within, come and breathe your breath upon me, for I have been born again. Holy Spirit, I surrender. Take me where you want to go. Plant me by your living water. Plant me deep so I can grow. You know, as this little girl just sitting and watching the beauty of this creation that my God had formed in front of me, and these lyrics pouring and cycling through my mind and my heart, I know that God was beginning to speak to me about his spirit and how my soul would be his tabernacle. See, I needed to see this visual so I could begin my walk of understanding with his spirit better. Now, this wasn't a supernatural sign or a billboard, right? We don't want to look for those things. (laughs) But in my walk of understanding his spirit better, this was what I needed to hear. And even though I know that God was speaking to me through this visual, see, you know, I know that the Holy Spirit, he's not an impersonal force. He's not the wind. And we're not the dead leaves that are just being pushed and pulled and without any free will or any option of our own. But in this moment, God was beginning me on his journey of what he was saying that he was going to do inside my soul. The Spirit, he speaks to us. He guides us. He invites us into living a deeper life with him. In Ephesians 1.13, the Bible tells us that when you believed, you were marked with him with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit. I love that. Visual, right? I'm marked. I'm marked with him, with a seal, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. The indwelling is the reality that God's presence comes to dwell in every believer at conversion. He's there. He's living within you. You've been cleansed from your sin through the cross of Christ. You have been transformed into holy ground where the Spirit of God resides. The Spirit was hovering over the waters. And now he resides in you as a follower of Christ. Ooh, that's beautiful. The Bible promises that he will never leave you. He guides He leads. He speaks. Woo! And sometimes, sometimes he convicts. Mm. That's not my favorite. That's not my favorite times, that's for sure. But he does that because he loves us. He encourages us and he counsels us. He heals those broken pieces within us. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is our seal for eternal life with God. A.W. Tozer says, first he comes in some degree and measure when we were converted. Otherwise, we wouldn't be converted. Without him, we couldn't be born again because we are born of the Spirit. But I'm talking about something different now, an advance over that. I'm talking about his coming and his possessing the full body mind, life, and heart, taking the whole personality over, gently but directly and bluntly, and making it his, that we may become a habitation of God through the Spirit. Can you remember what you were like before you first encountered Christ and who you are now? This is the working of the Holy Spirit, the possessing of the full body, the full mind, the full life, the full heart, and the taking over of the whole personality. Praise God. This is what we know as being filled with the Holy Spirit. 
The old has gone. The new has come. In Ephesians 5.18, Paul tells us, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So just as when you, kept, when you have to, um, when you drink wine and you are getting drunk, you have consumed a lot of it, right? This isn't a, you know, a, a drink of communion. This is you have consumed a lot to the point of being drunk. Now, we have to continually give our attention and expectation to the Holy Spirit in order to be filled. As we just read from Tozer, the Holy Spirit is gentle but he is direct, and he is blunt, so that we may become a habitation of God through his Spirit. Tozer goes on to say, Evangelical Christianity believes in the filling of the Holy Spirit, but few experience it. I'm just going to pause there, because when I first read that, that quote made me really sad. To think that The Holy Spirit is there and willing, but few experience him. He goes on to say, It lies under the snow, forgotten. I am praying that God may be able to melt away the ice from this blessed truth and let it spring up again alive, that the church and the people who hear may get some good out of it and not merely say, I believe while it's buried under the snow of inactivity and non-attention. He goes on to say, The Spirit-filled life is not a special, deluxe edition of of Christianity. It is part and parcel of the total plan of God for his people. Jim Rudd also says, Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not some form of advanced Christianity or super faith. It's basic Christianity. It's the standard of the New Testament Christianity, and it's God's will for all believers. So right now, we're just going to continue in this time of reflecting, and we're going to move into a time of inviting the Holy Spirit to fill us. But there's a couple things that we need to be aware of that the Bible says that can get in his way. So first of all, in Ephesians 4.30, the Bible tells us, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with him within whom you were what? Sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of all rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. You know, we've seen a lot of that in our country in in these past few months, especially in the past couple of weeks. And Paul's telling us, get rid of it. Those things are grieving the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit happens when we work against what the Spirit wants to do. So get rid of the bitterness. Get rid of the rage. Get rid of the anger, the arguing, the slander, and every form of malice. He's saying get rid of it. That's not good. It's not helping you. It's hurting you. The Holy Spirit desires to produce transformation in our lives. In Galatians 5.22, it says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What kind of life would you rather have? One that's producing fruit of bitterness and rage and anger, arguing, Or is your life showing the fruit of the Spirit that you are loving and kind and joyful? As we move into this time of prayer, I'm going to invite Aaron to come on up. 
we're going to begin with confessing areas where we've grieved the Holy Spirit by embracing or demonstrating attitudes or behaviors that are contrary to his fruit that he wants to produce. So as we sing this song, we just want to um, provide an opportunity, a place for you just in confessing. You can sit in your seat, you can kneel, you can stand, be open, and however you feel like the Lord is wanting to speak to you. So we just confess. So we confess how we've grieved him. Ashamed of what I've done, what I've become. These hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. You plead my cause. Ride my wrongs, you break my chains, you overcome, you gave your life to give me mine, you say that I am free, how can it be? The Bible also says to be aware of quenching the Holy Spirit. Grieving, that's pushing him away. Quenching him, that's that's restricting what he wants to say and do. 
In 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, we read, Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. Quenching the Holy Spirit, that happens when we resist his ongoing work in our lives. I love this, this concept of it's ongoing. Every day, every day the working and the moving of the Holy Spirit in your life. But when we resist that ongoing work, we, we've either become content, we're just good, I'm good here, Holy Spirit, I'm fine. We either are content or we've become apathetic in our spiritual journey. We need to confess that to him. So if you have your face-down journal, I want to encourage you to get this out. We're going to spend some time journaling before the Lord. If you're at home and you don't have a journal yet, feel free to grab a magazine next to your couch or a receipt out of your pocket or something and, and just start writing these things down. Prayerfully listing things that you've started to believe that God can't or won't do. This can be really challenging because we want to be followers of Jesus who believe God can do anything. But when we start getting real with ourselves, there are things that we think maybe it's just too big, too difficult, too heartbreaking if we ask and he doesn't answer the way we want to be answered. So just prayerfully begin to make this list of ways that you have quenched the Holy Spirit. Confessing the ways that we've resisted his work. Maybe we've ignored a call that he's put on our life. Or ignored daily promptings that you think would just be too disruptive. Maybe you've just been afraid of giving him total control. Or you've been afraid to ask for spiritual gifts, like the gift of speaking in tongues, or prophecy, healing, evangelism. In 1 Corinthians 12, we read, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To the one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. Why do you think he keeps repeating that phrase? By that one spirit. By that one spirit, he's giving all of these gifts. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of those tongues. All these are at work for of one and the same Spirit. And he is the one who distributes each one just as he determines. So if he's the one who's determining the gift, and he's the one giving the gift, why do we resist what he wants to give us? Who are we to think that we know ourselves better than our Creator? If you feel like God has given you a gift and you've thought, a 
that's a little too, too out of my comfort zone. Who are you to resist what he's giving? God gives the supernatural gifts through the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit that determines them. As we continue in this time of prayer, of just asking the Holy Spirit, what gift are you wanting to give me? You are my creator, my counselor, my guide. Forgive me for how I've resisted, how I've thought I'd rather have her gift or, oh, that looks cool over there. I, I want to be able to do that. Holy Spirit, that you would just forgive us for coveting that which you've given others. And that you would reveal to us the gift that you are giving to each one of us individually. wouldn't just be a moment of a, of a nice message and a nice response time that we would say the Holy Spirit sounds like a good idea, but we would understand and embrace the promise of the Holy Spirit that you said that you would give it to us, give him to us, to be with us forever, as we've already talked about this morning, as Jen has said, and that Holy Spirit is not just here with us, but it gives power, it gives authority. God, we thank you for the truth of that, for, again, for the promise of that. Give us boldness. Give us courage as we go out, as we leave here, as we go back tomorrow to our, our workplaces, to wherever you might lead us. God, continue to fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can reach the world around us. Around us. And just, again, let it not just be a, a one-day thing or a one-week thing as we read some devotionals and we think this sounds good, but let it be something that we fully embrace and cling to, just knowing that you are with us and you love us and you're making a way for us and you want to use us to bring people to you. 
God, just to waken us back up to that reality. And as we just sang here, God of revival, would you pour yourself out in this room uh, on these people? And again, as we, as we go to all over uh, the city of Columbus, as we go to other places, God, just, we need to carry you first. Help us just to, to be reminded of that today and the next day and the next. Just continue to fill us with your power and your spirit. God, we love you. We thank you for this time of ministry that we've had today. Continue to speak to us after we leave here today. Thank you so much. Pray this all in your name. Amen.